All right. Welcome, everyone. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Let me take a second and encourage everyone who's still chatting to try to take a seat, and we'll try to keep on schedule a little、uh, as best we can. So, welcome to this afternoon's session. My name is Damon Wilson. I'm executive vice president at the Atlantic Council of the United States. I couldn't be more delighted to be here in, here at Riga Conference、uh, with our sister organization,、uh, LATO,、um, putting on a wonderful conference. And I'm actually delighted to see so many of you in the room after a, a terrific lunch and with incredible weather that Riga is giving us.、Uh, there's quite a bit of temptation to be on the outside of this beautiful room rather than inside it. But this session is. An important one. It's an important discussion for the transatlantic community and our partners. The session post 2014 repercussions. What relations with regional powers for NATO, the European Union, and we have to put in the OSCE there as well.、Um, it's clear that the drivers of engagement of the transatlantic community in Eurasia and Central Asia, in particular, over the past decade plus, have been, really been led by the issues of energy and driven by Afghanistan. Um, the last decade, in particular, the transatlantic community has been focused by NATO's operation in Afghanistan, the supporting roles that the European Union and other partners have played in the region, and in turn, that's led to, in some respects, an unprecedented degree of engagement in Central Asia and cooperation with Russia.、Um, with the Russians, we've seen successful efforts on stemming counter narcotics, as well as we're sitting here in Riga, we've seen the success of a northern distribution network、uh, to supply. Uh, uh, supply the operations in Afghanistan. You've seen a European Union increasingly focused on the region, particularly economically, in, in Kazakhstan, and an OSC that's certainly been present. The Kazakhstan had a chairman in office and has been present throughout the region, but is still working through challenges to define its continuing role there. But against that backdrop, the reality is. We're facing a drawdown in Afghanistan of, of our of forces, the end of the International Security Assistance Force, the beginning of Operation Resolute Support. Yes, but the challenge that our leaders are going into in 2014 is ending this war, this transition, without walking away, without abandoning not just Afghanistan but Eurasia, Central Asia in particular.、Um, how do we think about 2014 and having a policy, a strategy towards this region? That isn't a function of it's not just an appendage of what's happening in Afghanistan, but in and of itself. As leaders convene next year at various summits, the ingredients for success for a NATO summit are actually outside the scope of NATO in some degrees. It's economic, the economic and political sphere. It's why this conversation we've got the European Union, the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, to succeed on some of the ideas: the Silk Road, Eurasian tra trade and transit,、uh, embracing these regional partners. It takes a broader network, a broader swath of actors.、Um, so this is about engagement in Eurasia, Central Asia, but also Afghanistan itself, relationship with Russia, with China, Pakistan, India, Iran—a very complex set of actors.、And、I don't think we can be under any illusion that there will be an urge, a temptation among our political elites, our publics, to step back, to disengage. And the reality is that the region will remain volatile, with both huge opportunities. But also real challenges. So to get into this conversation, we have a fantastic panel lined up.、Uh, we've got the we've got the、uh, a panel that represents the institutions of most importance in the region: the OSCE, NATO, the European Union, but also voices from the region as well as the military side of the equation.、Uh, Lamberto Zanye is the Secretary General of the OSCE, sitting in the center since 2011. An Italian diplomat, he served as the UN Special Representative for Kosovo, the head of UNMIC. Uh, and so, served as the director of the Conflict Prevention Center at the OSCE prior to that.、Uh, sitting to his right, Kalinda Grabar Katarovic is the Assistant Secretary General for Public Diplomacy at NATO.、Uh, she served as,、uh, as both the European Integration and Foreign Minister of Croatia,、uh, where she led her country into the European Union and NATO.、Uh, I had the pleasure of working with her as Ambassador to the United States、uh, in her position there, and she also was also elected to Parliament. Sitting、uh, to the left, Patricia Floor is the European Union Special Representative for Central Asia. She served as Germany's ambassador and special envoy for Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, Central Asia, but also as the ambassador to Georgia and the vice chair of the UN Commission on the Study of Women. Sitting closest to me,、uh, Ambassador Timur Urzayev, the ambassador at large and now special representative for Afghanistan from Kazakhstan. He brings an important voice from the region to this conversation. 
A career diplomat within the foreign ministry has extensive experience dealing with Russia, the CIS, CSTO, and the Customs Union, which have come up in some of our previous conversations. And finally, to round out our conversation, Lieutenant General David Hogue, the U.S. military representative to NATO. He's served as, a, as an army officer with exp extensive experience in NATO, I mean in Europe, particularly in Germany. He's commanding general of the Joint Multinational Training Command and deputy commander of the NATO training mission in Afghanistan, as well as the commanding general of the U.S. Army in Africa. So to kick this conversation off, let me go to the center to our secretary general from the OSC. Um, the OSCE is, plays a particular role in this region because every country is a member of the OSCE in Central Asia. Um, Kazakhstan had the chairmanship and office, but you have some challenges as you think about the continued future engagement of the OSC in Central Asia. Give us a view from Vienna of how you see the future post-2014 and the role that the OSCE can play in keeping this region connected to the transatlantic community. Right. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, in my short introductory statements, I would like to cover two issues. One is why the OSC and what is the OSC doing and, and where are we going? But secondly, what are we seeing on the ground and what's our take on, on what needs to be done from our, from our perspective? So on the, on the first side, uh, let's say that the OSC perhaps uh, wouldn't spring to mind as the, uh, the, the most obvious actor when one looks at Afghanistan in 2014. So why, why the OSC? And uh, the OSC uh, has uh, uh, strong points in a number, in a num from a number of angles. Uh, first of all, the ownership of the countries of the region. The role of Central Asian countries within the organization has grown over the year. Uh, so there is a stronger ownership, a stronger role that the, these countries are playing. And these countries are telling us more and more clearly that they have concerns in relation to Afghanistan. And obviously they see themselves as having a strong role to play. So what we're discussing with them is uh, how can we translate this into uh, activities on the ground. The OSC in itself is a security organization, a security organization with a very broad agenda that encompasses the uh, political military dimension and increasingly the so-called TNT issues, uh, the transnational threats, uh, uh, but also the economic uh, security area of, uh, uh, of operation, and of course uh, the, the uh, so-called human dimension, which uh, includes strong attention for uh, rule of law, for democratic governance, and so a number of tools that we're deploying there. Um, so from, from this perspective, the, the, the OSC has an ability to uh, adjust uh, to what the actors of the region feel needs to be done. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, quite a, an interesting presence on, on the ground. We have in Central Asia uh, more than 500 experts in the five Central Asian countries engaging all of these areas, working very close to, to the governments, advising the governments, but also listening to what the governments are telling us and uh, uh, helping us reorient our operation in relation to, uh, to what we're hearing and what we're saying. And in addition to that, uh, Afghanistan is a partner of the OSC, is a partner country with a very special status, and among the partner countries is perhaps the, the most uh, active in terms uh, of uh, operational uh, engagement, and we are uh, uh, working with the Afghans in a number, in a number of areas, from uh, training of border guards to training of diplomats to uh, uh, um, uh, work on policing, and then in a minute I'll, maybe I'll give a couple, of, uh, a couple of more details on this. Um, the, the, uh, through, their, through our missions, we of course uh, look at developments on the ground and we try to develop a strategy for the organization. Keeping in mind that uh, looking at Afghanistan after 2014 or post-2014, uh, uh, it is clear that there is no individual uh, international organization, no individual country to make a difference. We need to have a shared strategy in the, in the international community. This is one of the things uh, we are uh, trying to develop within the organization, but it is also clear that within the, in, inside the organization, which is as you know, a, a, a pretty uh, a large organization encompasses a number of key players, key stakeholders uh, uh, interested in the Afghanistan issue. We, we have different visions. So one of the issues is to try to get uh, everybody on board and to, uh, and to get a strategy that feels everybody involved, included, and comfortable with, uh, with what we are doing. And, and this is a part of the challenge, also considering that we are covering only one uh, sector, if you want, of the neighborhood, of the Afghanistan neighborhood. We are also part, of course, of the Heart of Asia process, 
And there we see uh, the, the additional multiplicity of actors and the increasing uh, complication that this brings uh, to the table when we start to develop a strategy uh, for the international community. Looking, uh, looking at what's going on on the ground and talking to, uh, to the participating states uh, uh, from the region, uh, we see that uh, uh, there are concerns and there is a scope for us to operate in, in two directions. There are concerns in terms of uh, challenges stemming from Afghanistan affecting their own security. Uh, whether this is uh, fundamentalism, and we see this spreading in the region, in uh, Kazakhstan, for instance, the, uh, this is a relatively new phenomenon that has been, uh, uh, that, that has been now um, observed for some time, uh, and, and in other countries are equally affected by this. Of course, the, the uh, drug trafficking, uh, drug trafficking is promoting uh, organized crime. Uh, uh, this is uh, obviously uh, um, uh, um, also leveraging the fact that the uh, economic governance in some of these countries is still rather weak. Uh, there is still corruption, so there is a need for a strong international presence to assist, to assist in the economic development, but also uh, to assist in countering these, these phenomena, so addressing the uh, issue of economic governance is very important in itself as, as an area of engagement, as it is with Afghanistan itself. Uh, um, uh, and of course, uh, terrorism uh, and uh, trafficking of all sorts, from uh, weapons to trafficking of human beings, the, the agenda is, is very long. So you need to build capacity, you need to work in the rule of law area. So the, the, the kind of uh, civilian engagement in the security field uh, that we do promote in the OSCE, we see, uh, and we see because this is, uh, there is a demand from the countries of the region, that is an area where the international community needs to invest more. Um, the other thing we do in the OSC is uh, we, we found out over time that we are a good platform for engagement of uh, uh, all relevant actors. We, of course, have close consultations with the European Union and with NATO, uh, but in our events also we uh, um, get a, a very strong interaction with other uh, organizations like the CSTO or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, we're now discussing possibility to step up our cooperation in relation to Afghanistan, so that uh, through <coughs> various channels, uh, we try to promote and to encourage the involvement of, of everybody within the organization. Then the challenge, again, is to, uh, uh, to develop an agenda that is, that is broad enough. When it comes to engagement of the on the ground, of course, we have a number of initiatives, like the, uh, the, the Border Management uh, uh, Staff College in, in Dushanbe. We train there 450 Afghan guards, to, uh, border guards, together with the Tajiks and together with, uh, with the services from other Central Asian uh, countries. Uh, we have a customs facility in, uh, in Bishkek. Uh, uh, we are talking about a, a regional police uh, cooperation facility that we would like to establish in the near future. Um, so there are a number of initiatives underway, plus projects. We have a patrolling project on the Tajik-Afghan border, uh, etc. Um, so w what we need to do is, is to see how this can be more directly related to Afghanistan. This is one of the areas where, within the organization, we have a bit of a problem. Uh, there is a political problem, first of all, because not everybody uh, agrees to that. Uh, so we have, a, a, we have some blockages internally uh, in terms of our own engagement on the ground in Afghanistan. And there is the larger issue of, uh, of the civilian engagement on the ground in Afghanistan uh, without adequate security. So the, the problem of uh, how can, especially for an organization that is really working at the grassroots level with the local communities, protect itself and find a space uh, to, to operate effectively. In some areas, we, we managed to uh, still to work in Afghanistan. For instance, we've been supporting uh, um, processes of preparation of elections, and we are looking at doing it again mm -hmm. next year, but we'll need a decision in the organization, so also, also that. So that's, that's where we are going, engaging with the international community more broadly, mainly through the heart of Asia, and, uh, and there will be a meeting in New York, which we are, will attend later this month, and, uh, uh, and uh, letting uh, the countries of the region, uh, as much as possible, drive the process, drive the discussion, but with everybody else supporting. Thank you. I've got some follow-up for you, but I'll come back to that, because I want to turn to uh, Ambassador Kalinda Grobar uh, Katarovich. You represent NATO in this conversation, which has been such an important actor, uh, given the engagement of ISAF for the past decade. Um, you're drawing down. There's a lot of conversation about how the alliance will have a follow-on presence. But how do you address the concerns, the skepticism in the region 
that really this will be disengagement. This will be withdrawal of the alliance uh, when the operation ends. Uh, thank you, Damon. Uh, first of all, I'm very honored to be on this panel with the distinguished speakers. And I thank the organizers for putting this um, panel together, as a matter of fact, because at NATO, we speak about these topics. We speak about NATO's engagement in Afghanistan, and we speak about partnerships, but we rarely bring them together. So in, in that sense, for the topics to in, inter, uh, intersect is, is very important to me. Uh, additionally, I have been on both sides of the aisle, so to say. Um, in my former lives, I, I worked with getting Croatia into the EU, into NATO, but also with post-conflict uh, resolution and uh, with many of the fears that were shared uh, by Croatia and some other countries in the region that I think also reflect um, in the region that we're talking about today, perhaps to a different degree. Um, I have also been visiting the region, um, in particular Afghanistan, ever since 2006 when I visited for the first time. So I have seen many changes, but also I see many challenges, many open issues um, ahead of us. And when I do visit Afghanistan lately, I often think of the OSCE, for instance, looking at the crucial election that will take place, presidential election in 2014, and the role that, I force, uh, that we can foresee for you and for other international organizations, uh, for the European Union as well, in uh, building upon the security situation that ISAF is providing for, together with the ANSF. So to build upon those processes, um, it's definitely a joint endeavor, a joint effort. I think the basic message that we are, um, that we want to leave, at least um, uh, 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 specifically with the Afghan population, with Afghan people, is that Afghanistan post-2014 will be standing on its own, but will not be standing alone. I think we need to put a bit more effort into communicating that, not just on part of NATO and our ISAF partners, but really the international community um, as well. Um, we do need to tackle those issues um, as, uh, of the potential of the regional uh, countries to positively impact on the future development of, of Afghanistan. The area definitely will remain consequential to Euro-Atlantic uh, security and stability. And in that sense, um, the uh, alliance will remain engaged. But let me remind everyone that NATO started the partnerships with the countries in Central Asia before we, uh, before ISAF started as an operation. So we have our partnership Dating back, uh, uh, partnerships dating back to the 1990s. And the best reassurance, I think, that we can uh, give to those countries and to those people is that we will continue to build those partnerships, that we will continue to deepen and widen them and give them specific content, specific substance that is relevant to the future of those particular countries, but also to regional stability as well. Um, from NATO, I will concentrate on the security aspect as well, as security remains a serious challenge in Afghanistan and in the region. Um, and international efforts to increase security and stability in Afghanistan have involved many international actors, NATO members and operational partners in ISAF, um, regional partners that we're talking about today, other international institutions, but also NGOs, very importantly, and of course the government and the people of Afghanistan. Um, as we continue through the transition to full Afghan responsibility for security in that country at the end of 2014, and as we look at the ways um, how to continue to train, advise, and assist Afghanistan in the context of the new operation that will follow the resolute support, the regional perspective, the regional um, uh, approach will continue to be essential. Long-lasting peace and stability in Afghanistan requires a regional approach. And a stable Afghanistan, of course, in turn, enhances regional stability and security and prosperity. Um, the international community is committed to working with Afghanistan and with regional powers to support a stable and successful future. As I said, I'm concentrating on the security aspects, but also economic and political engagement will continue to be needed. 
Um, Central Asian countries and especially Afghanistan's neighbors will play, in cru will play a crucial role in helping Afghanistan move forward. And they will benefit as well. Uh, the reasons for this are plain. A neighborhood that is stable, that is prosperous, uh, benefits all of its inhabitants. I know that some of our partners in Central Asia today are concerned about the post-2014 period. They are unsure of how their relationship with NATO will evolve, and I suppose with other international organizations and institutions as well. And they are wary of particular threats, including, of course, um, terrorist threats, but border security, uh, drug trafficking also being uh, many of the threats to regional and international security as well. As with our partners in other parts of the world, NATO's partnership with the Central Asian countries are based on political dialogue and practical cooperation. And through our partnerships with the particular countries, we'll define their political, military, and security sector reforms, and then we work uh, through concrete measures. We provide concrete support to those reforms uh, by providing focused, country-specific advice and assistance. Uh, I want to focus for a moment on that practical cooperation because um, they, there can be a great deal of specificity here. Um, NATO and any given partner build their practical cooperation based on what is practical, on uh, what their strengths are and what their needs are. And we will continue to uh, maintain dialogue with these countries in order to define uh, those elements. NATO has expertise and experience with issues that are of primary concern to Central Asian countries, such as counter-narcotics, education and training of the military and security forces, and of course capabilities development. And we're working with them um, to that effect in many of these areas. And let me just mention just a few um, of the concrete aspects of cooperation, that is building security and, and, and peacekeeping cooperation, especially counterterrorism, capabilities, uh, border security, crisis management, and civil emergency planning preparedness for different environmental disasters and natural disasters, so in, including geo-environmental security. Um, in cases of uh, such as landslides or earthquakes or floods, um, then we, what we do is mountain search and rescue, uh, managing waste um, that is left over from the Soviet times, uh, different chemicals, um, this eliminating excess munitions that pose uh, a threat to the civilian um, security, um, Counter cross border, countering cross border crime and, and drug trafficking, but also what is very interesting and I think what's become very important is cyber network, cyber security, especially how to provide that for their NGOs and for the non governmental sector. So, all of our Central Asian partners have individually participated in Science for Peace and Security projects, actually, quite a few of them. Uzbekistan was involved in over 50 projects, um, including one addressing the conversion of toxic chemicals. Kazakhstan has been involved in more than 20 uh, science for peace and security projects, um, and they host a yearly multinational exercise that helps to improve our interoperability. Um, I could go on and on with all of these projects, but let me just mention one that is particularly dear to my heart, and that is Virtual Silk Afghanistan. We talk a lot about Silk Afghanistan. Um, we at NATO have actually given it a very practical dimension in providing broadband internet capabilities, first to our partners in Central Asia, and now we're doing that in Afghanistan as well, connecting the country to the world, providing for information, for education, which is certainly the basis for development of society, but also of maintaining peace and security. Uh, and um, we uh, will work and continue to work very closely with the European Union on that. Now, let me just mention Russia and our cooperation with just Russia brief. mm -hmm. very briefly, because, uh, of course, it's in Russia's interest to maintain security um, and stability of the area. So we work together in the counter-narcotics program, but also in some of the education of the Afghan forces in training of their pilots and providing for spare parts for the helicopters. So... Um, let me conclude um, that the core issue here, cooperative security partnership, is, one, is the core work of NATO, um, in addition to, of course, our collective defense and crisis management. 
And we know that security does not and cannot exist in vacuum. Today's risks are um, global. Tomorrow's risks will be too. So delivering security must be a cooperative effort. And NATO will continue to build its partnerships in Central Asia and around the world. Thank you very much. I want to turn now to the European Union, to Ambassador Floor. We've heard from the representatives from the OSCE, which, of course, these Central Asia, they're members of the OSCE. We've heard from uh, uh, NATO as well, uh, which by definition, by the presence of having a major military operation in Afghanistan, was present in a serious way. The EU is a little bit different here. We've just had the previous conversation about the Eastern Partnership, and clearly the EU has that as a major, major actor in the Eastern Partnership countries. Central Asia, the broader Eurasia region is a little bit different, um, where the European Union has had a quieter presence perhaps in Afghanistan and Central Asia. Um, let me hear the perspective from you, Ambassador, on how the European Union thinks about engagement and policy in Eurasia, and particularly Central Asia and Afghanistan. Uh, thank you very much, and I uh, would like to s uh, start actually with um, uh, telling you a little bit about uh, my own experience when traveling uh, in Central Asia, uh, when talking actually to Central Asian uh, uh, leaders, uh, governments, um, about um, their neighborhood, uh, because um, there is, of course, a, a big anxiety and fear at the moment in Central Asia, because they are looking next door, and um, although they acknowledge that um, uh, NATO is drawing down and not leaving or not exiting, but they do, of course, also see that there is a, a balance um, uh, of forces shifting in the area and they, wor they worry about their own future under these uh, particular conditions. Now, um, the European Union is uh, a welcome partner from their point of view when they look at um, who can actually work with them towards uh, stabilization. Uh, so what roles for the different organizations? The European Union actually has started um, uh, engaging seriously with Central Asia in um, 2008 with the EU uh, Central Asia strategy. Since then, we have really uh, created uh, deep relationships with the countries in the region. Uh, there are EU lit delegations, we have partnership agreements with them, we have uh, a big number of um, assistance programs, and by the way, um, we have programs which also address security issues. So uh, if you think about the EU only as a soft power in terms of not engaging on security, then uh, you are wrong. Uh, the EU actually in coordination with OECE, OCE, NATO and the US um, also has been working intensively on border management, border security, countering uh, the tra drug trafficking, uh, also looking at terrorism. So we have the tools. And among the new tools that we also created last year was um, a high-level security dialogue, EU Central Asia, because uh, the key is to start from the kind of threats and dangers um, the Central Asian see, their priorities, and then to identify where we can actually uh, engage. For the EU to, to remain engaged in Central Asia and Afghanistan, uh, is uh, in our own interest. We would not serve our own interests if we consider to actually decrease our engagement because of what might be happening in Afghanistan. Because the, the threats which uh, might uh, emerge from this overall region, be it um, drug trafficking, be it terrorism, uh, be it um, radicalization, uh, they actually uh, can reach and do sometimes reach European borders, also in terms of migration, in terms of refugees. So it is in our own interest. And many people, including the high representative uh, and the, the whole leadership of the European Union, has said repeatedly that the EU is committed to long-term engagement in the region, looking at the next decade and not only the next um, uh, year. And this is a strategic choice, and we will stand and um, uh, by um, uh, that. But of course, I do share what was said uh, by my colleagues here on the panel that um, uh, this cannot be the effort of any one international actor. Uh, the uh, challenges in the area are so huge and the risks so obvious that we need to bring to bear the instruments and the weight um, of all these different organizations uh, in the region. And here I want to underline that um, Central Asia and Afghanistan is, uh, it's, this, it's one area where power lines uh, do intersect, Russian Federation, China, 
uh, India, Pakistan, uh, US, NATO, many, many players. But it is an area where, uh, at this moment, we do actually share a common interest, which is uh, to actually uh, have no dust destabilization, but to keep um, the uh, region stable, to keep it secure, and of course that also means uh, to work on social and economic development and on rule of law. And I would like to say that especially when we come to rule of law, uh, human rights, uh, uh, civil society development, of course the European Union has uh, a deep experience. And so we have something to share and it is actually also accepted uh, by the uh, partners um, uh, in the region. And so we should be looking together with um, uh, the US, with, with NATO, with the OECE, at actually who does what best in the region and how do, do we combine that. But I would also say with regard to Russia, that of course the, the Russian Federation does see elementary security interests of itself um, uh, actually uh, uh, possibly threatened in the, in the area. And of course they have a memory of Soviet invasion and withdrawal uh, from the 90s. And so against that background, it's also an area where I think we need to work with the Russian Federation in a constructive way in order to see uh, how we can engage. Um, lastly, uh, none of, we are talking now about the role of external actors, but uh, uh, to be serious, of course, the ownership needs to be with um, the governments and the, the, the countries in the region. So the ownership uh, from Afghanistan, um, Uzbekistan, hopefully uh, Kazakhstan, uh, and all the others in the region will be crucial in, actually in, in achieving stability. And therefore, the EU is behind the Istanbul process. We are committed to support um, confidence-building measures and regional cooperation through these mechanisms. Uh, but it will only function if um, the governments and the societies are serious about wanting it uh, to be uh, successful. And I myself, um, traveling also to Kabul and Islamabad and others, I was struck, and I am struck, by the absence of um, cooperation mechanisms, security mechanisms, consultation mechanisms uh, in, in the region, both within Central Asia, but then also going beyond between Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the Central Asians, and, and, and others in the region. And so I think this is a key challenge which we should work on, and certainly, uh, speaking from the <coughs> EU perspective, we have uh, created uh, a lot of institutions in that regard, and uh, hopefully we could share some of that um, with um, uh, the partners um, uh, in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I want to turn to the region and to uh, uh, Ambassador Zarev now. The, w it's clear that over the years, the whole premise of helping to support the sovereignty and independence of Central Asia has been buttressed by the engagement of the transatlantic community, the institutions that we've heard before. Um, but the reality is this region sits uh, looking north to Russia, east to China, uh, south to uncertainty, whether Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, or even Iran. Um, you've heard, and I think the region has heard, a lot of reassurance from both the institutions and from uh, countries in the transatlantic community. But how believable is that? You've seen engagement in this region in the past. Uh, how do you, does your purge from Kazakhstan uh, influence your perspective about what's coming with 2014 and beyond? Uh, firstly, I, I, I think I, uh, <laughs> representing Kazakhstan, I can speak on behalf of the whole Central Asia uh, because uh, as for the Central Asian countries, we have similar positions and uh, uh, many common approaches to the uh, solving of the Afghanistan problems. And uh, on behalf of uh, 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 the neighboring countries, I can speak about uh, uh, um, uh, the prospects of the uh, uh, collaboration of our countries with uh, uh, the international organizations uh, which are represented here. Uh, uh, by all means, reconstruction is a, a common problem, is a common challenge, and, uh, not only for the region, uh, for the whole world. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, think uh, about one very important thing. Uh, we should not transform the Afghanistan uh, uh, problem uh, from, regional into, uh, uh, from global into uh, uh, regional aspect only. Uh, because uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, there are many challenges, uh, not only uh, uh, inside uh, Afghanistan, but for the uh, whole world. And uh, that is why 
uh, the government of Kazakhstan uh, cooperates with uh, uh, as a constructive uh, uh, member of international community, participates in all the processes uh, in and around Afghanistan. And uh, our main uh, uh, vision on the uh, Afghanistan uh, uh, issues is uh, the continual uh, uh, civilians of the international organizations such as UN, NATO, EU, OIC, OEC, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, CSTO, uh, CARIC, and uh, so on. Uh, and uh, as, we, uh, as far as we uh, talk about uh, the post-2014 uh, phenomena, I should like um, mostly uh, speak on uh, Afghanistan, what is happening uh, within Afghanistan, and what the Central Asian countries, including the government of Kazakhstan, see the perspectives of the post uh, uh, 2014. Um, uh, from our uh, uh, perspective, uh, the regional cooperation is of, uh, by all means, of high uh, significance at this point. And uh, uh, Mrs. Flor uh, has, already, has already said about the Istanbul process, which is uh, 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 the most important regional process uh, around uh, Afghanistan. But on the other hand, we, are not, uh, uh, we have not illusions on the uh, effectiveness of uh, any kind of process uh, uh, because uh, you know that uh, the uh, members of the Istanbul process are different countries with different uh, stra strategies, with different geopolitical approaches uh, to the problems of Afghanistan. You know, uh, uh, the Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, uh, all of these countries are in one process and uh, 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 nevertheless we uh, uh, made uh, big successes and uh, uh, the last uh, Almaty conference uh, of the Istanbul process uh, earlier this year in April uh, uh, led us to uh, issue uh, 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 the declaration with the uh, uh, many common approaches to uh, the uh, uh, issues of Afghanistan. And uh, the contribution of Kazakhstan was uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, creating uh, the so-called uh, 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 the platform of regional interest. What it means? It means that we should create uh, a common shared interest which will be, maybe to some extent, it, it, uh, I can uh, uh, call it as an obligation uh, around the interests of the region. And uh, uh, we should uh, stick firmly uh, uh, to uh, this interest and uh, not to play some geopolitical, uh, on geopolitical instruments and to transform the uh, great game uh, 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 idea to the great gain idea. As for uh, the, uh, um, I, just a few remarks on uh, uh, Kazakhstan-Afghanistan uh, 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 bilateral relations. We uh, cooperate very uh, uh, successfully and uh, Kazakhstan uh, uh, just uh, uh, in the uh, coming uh, week, we, are, um, uh, we have an annual uh, uh, meeting of the intergovernmental commissions and we uh, uh, cooperate with uh, Afgan Afghanistan partners in many spheres of uh, uh, economy relations, uh, in the sphere of transport, in the sphere of education. You are well aware about the educational problem of Kazakhstan to uh, uh, study 1,000 uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, uh, young people uh, in uh, Kazakhstan universities. And uh, uh, I speak about uh, this program uh, uh, because uh, uh, this is the priority. Uh, we prioritize uh, the educational uh, sphere in the uh, uh, recovering, uh, uh, rehabilitation of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, in, in, uh, Kazakhstan uh, offered a number of initiatives that uh, has been underway. Uh, in particular, during the Almaty conference, we um, uh, we uh, said about uh, the uh, uh, one need of uh, international community and we are waiting for the support of our uh, uh, partners uh, uh, to create a regional uh, United Nations office uh, in Almaty aimed at uh, the 
uh, focused uh, economic uh, uh, help assistance to Afghanistan, uh, especially in including humanitarian and uh, uh, economic assistance to Afghanistan. Uh, Kazakhstan, with their partners, uh, uh, with its partners, including uh, Latvia, has also been working on the creation of transit facilities. And uh, uh, as far as you know, uh, we uh, have already finished uh, the Kazakhstan part of the project of the railway uh, uh, route uh, from Kazakhstan via Turkmenistan, and uh, uh, there are two directions uh, to develop it to Iran and to Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, Kazakhstan government uh, pays much attention to the uh, creating new uh, uh, trade, commercial, economic uh, trading routes in the region. That will be uh, uh, the most important contribution of Kazakhstan to the uh, uh, recovery of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, uh, and uh, the same to some other projects with uh, Russia, Kyrgyzstan uh, and Tajikistan uh, uh, oriented to uh, Afghanistan as well. Uh, as for uh, Kazakhstan and NATO, NATO uh, has a successful uh, story of cooperation. Uh, from uh, 2003, more than uh, 13,000 NATO flights uh, were implemented through our uh, airspace. And we are still playing the uh, most active role uh, uh, in the uh, questions of uh, reverse uh, uh, transit of ISAF forces uh, according to uh, the agreements with NATO. Um, besides, uh, on May uh, 28th, uh, uh, we uh, uh, renewed uh, in Bishkek, we renewed uh, uh, as a member of uh, CSTO, uh, we renewed uh, our decision to support uh, uh, the Afghan uh, authorities after the withdrawal uh, of ISAF forces. Uh, so, uh, speaking uh, on uh, collaboration of regional powers with uh, EU and NATO, I will not uh, uh, speak maybe more because, right. uh, yes, uh, Ms. Flo has already uh, said uh, everything. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, can I pick up on that yes. point? Because I think that's, um, that's the right segue. You started off your, your, your statements with something that I think um, I want to toss that ball down to, to General, General Hogue. Um, you, you start off with a very important statement of don't let Afghanistan go from being a global problem to being a regional problem. So when you hear that, General Hogue, uh, as a, a U.S. rep to, to NATO, how can you assure uh, our friends in Central Asia that that's not where we're headed? Yeah, you know, this is, uh, Damien, thanks for the great question. I was really waiting for that one. <laughs> you know, when you deal with the press, sometimes you get these questions from the press, and you really don't want to answer the questions, so you just change your answer anyway. So I'm not going to do that to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. And, uh, and this is also because it's after lunchtime. This is the time where you, you tell a joke, and my, my classic joke is the pig with the wooden leg. But I'm not going to tell it, and, and the only reason I'm not going to tell it is because I have been threatened by my wife. If I ever tell that joke again, I'm on the couch for life. So it, it's off the table. Uh -oh. So, you know, how do, how do we convince and how do we uh, uh, provide the support that's required in the region when we talk uh, post-2014? That's really what we're talking about. And, uh, and there, there's a lot of different facets to this. So let's see if I can break it down to a simple tanker terminology. First of all, we're going to maintain our engagement with with Afghanistan. We're going to maintain our engagement, mill-to-mill -mill engagement. We're going to maintain our mill-to-mill -mill engagement with other members within that region. And that's important. And it's a different type of mill-to-mill -mill engagement than what we are, military-to-military -military engagement, than what we are doing in Afghanistan. Because in other regions outside of Afghanistan, we must work through our U.S. Embassy because the senior representative for the United States is, in fact, the ambassador. And so that's a team effort. And, and there you get the mix of the political and the military interaction as we, as we, as we work our, our lanes, if you will, maintaining relationships. Uh, just as important is maintaining uh, the alliance and the partners' uh, participation in the region, not just Afghanistan, but the region. And oh, by the way, simultaneously maintaining and getting back to uh, military training, if you will, uh, outside of Afghanistan. In other words, getting NATO and our partners back into uh, some type of normality as far as we go forward on, on training. And, and all those are very, very doable, but there, there are some challenges. There's really about uh, three challenges that we're going to face as we move forward to maintain stability in the region, 
maintain the viability of the alliance, and also continue to maintain that connection with our partners. When you think about NATO, there's about 180 plus nations that are either that are connected to NATO, the 28 that are members and then the rest that are partners, and that's worldwide. So it's just not in Europe that we're worried about. Okay, so I mentioned there's about three potential troubled areas that could jack this all up. Okay, the first one is there are other regional powers within this area that may or may not appreciate third-party, bilateral, multilateral, NATO, EU, you name it, interaction in that region. That will have to be worked, and there will have to be compromise. That is not good or bad. That is just a fact of the region. And, and we acknowledge that. Okay, great. The second one is uh, as we transition, as we go from the ISAF mission to resolute support, the challenge we are all going to face is everybody wants this, uh, we'll call it a peace dividend because that seems to be the, the vogue word. And so now nations will go, well, we don't need to maintain our military capabilities or whatever that may be. And, uh, and so I'm going to call that one the political will to maintain defense or military capabilities as appropriate for the nations, whatever that is, and, and every nation a little bit differently. And then the final one, and, and we're all being affected by that, is, is the, uh, the economy. I mean, it's not going to get fixed anytime soon. And what does that affect? That affects our ability to train together. That affects our ability to do those military-to-military -military engagements. On the U.S. side, it could affect our dollars that we have for our international education training program. We call it IMET, where we, we work with nations to bring their officers, their non-commissioned officers, to our schools to have a professional education program that may or may not exist, or to just give them a different broadening experience and show them a, a different way or ex, uh, expose them to a different way of, of, of education. Uh, and so the, the money piece is going to be tough. And so we have to, as a, and I'll speak for the military, we have to be a lot smarter on how we do our training business. We're not going to go back to the reforger mentality where you have corps, tens of thousands of soldiers rolling through, deploying from all over the place and rolling through the European countryside. It's not going to happen. It's not feasible, nor do I believe it would be acceptable to our populations. But there's a lot of other things we can leverage. We have live, virtual, constructive and gaming environments. And, and that technology allows headquarters at all levels, from the strategic level all the way actually to the tactical level, to, to work in a virtual environment from their home station, from their country, uh, and still accomplish the training objectives that we need uh, to accomplish to be a viable alliance. And then that brings me to the final piece, which is NATO standardization. NATO standardization is a beautiful thing. It is the thing that has allowed the Alliance and our partners, as you start expanding that, to be able to be interoperable. What that means is we're able to talk to each other. We're able to have a common operational picture of where our forces are at and what they are doing. Uh, and then our standards, our STANAGs, as, was, as they're referred to, are those standard operating procedures so when units from different countries that are part of NATO or have been associated with NATO as partners come together, we're all speaking the same military terminology that I know really, you know, on the civilian side, I'll say just look at us and think we're from Mars, but that's okay. But, you know, that's important. And that's something that we need to continue to push within the NATO environment because those things, in my opinion, have become stagnant. And, and, and that's, that is the heart and the power of NATO. That's the heart and the power of the alliance as it works with its partners to, to push forward. So... What I'm talking about for post-2014 is maintaining that military -mil relationship, either as we're doing now uh, in Afghanistan as we adjust to a train, advise, and assist, working together with our partners, providing them that, that confidence that we're still going to be there, and we are, so that they are in with us, which brings in the global effort versus a regional effort, and then within the region, providing our, uh, our opportunity through the embassy to work our, our different programs for you know, education, training, uh, and exercises. And then on the NATO side, as I mentioned, we, we've, got, we've got some work to do, and, and we can't afford just to say, okay, that's it, there's no more threats in the world, because I think, I think this room understands that it, it is a fairly dangerous environment that we live in.
So thank you. Thank you very much, General, for that uh, plain spoken uh, exposition. I want to bring in the audience shortly, but before I do, let me ask one question and then I'll, I'll see Peter and I'll catch others, others to come in. We've got a little bit less than 30 minutes. Um, we're sitting here in the Baltic states and when you think about the OSCE, Helsinki principles, you think about uh, what, what, what binds OSCE, EU, NATO, shared values, a commitment to rule of law, democracy, human rights. Um, how does that in impact? Uh, Ambassador, you mentioned uh, the issue of importance for the European Union, but there wasn't a lot of conversation about that. As you think about forging a more durable partnership when the security impetus of Afghanistan is off the table, how are you dealing with uh, issues of the values, the democracy, rule of law, corruption, and, and what's the demand from the region, uh, uh, Ambassador Uzayev, from the region, given what engagement with some of these institutions requires? Maybe back to you, Secretary General. Yeah, uh, what, what I'm finding in, uh, uh, as we are reoriented our, reorienting our operation to focus more on, as I said earlier, on the challenges stemming from Afghanistan and helping also the countries of the region uh, to better reach out themselves and assist uh, from their perspective uh, the development of Afghanistan. One area where uh, I'm finding uh, a lot of interest and a lot of demands is the so-called transnational, transnational threats field, as I, as, I, as I mentioned. So working, uh, looking at terrorism, looking at, uh, at uh, trafficking, uh, organized crime, etc., and fighting uh, uh, these new developments. This requires complex strategies where you can mainstream uh, uh, issues of the rule of law or good governance, you can in fact work in all the what we call the traditional OSC dimensions, including a strong uh, attention uh, to uh, um, uh, the, the, the rule of law, for instance, and the issue of uh, strengthening uh, democratic institu institutions in the countries where, where we operate as a part of a larger strategy that is aimed at addressing these challenges. So this is, this is something where we find a good buying from the countries of the region, uh, uh, even in, in situations where uh, in some areas you may see hesitations in involvement on, on programs that uh, address in isolation, if you want, the situation of human rights in a certain area, in a certain field. But if you include it in a larger program, then this becomes uh, uh, more easily acceptable. So I think that be is becoming more and more part of the approach that we are taking to the region. Did you want to add to that, and, and, and either, either of you? Yeah, yes, I, I would like to add to that, because uh, uh, an essential component of our partnerships with the countries in the region is their adherence to these fundamental documents such as the UN Charter, the Helsinki Final Act, Universal Declaration on Human Rights, but also on uh, counter-proliferation, etc. And also very important parts of our partnerships of concrete action is um, building integrity, basically fighting corruption and uh, helping the military and security sector to fight corruption within their ranks. And then we see that that gets translated across the government, that they use the best practices and lessons learned to fight corruption in other areas as well. And of course, uh, another impor important component is improving defense education, as all of these countries are moving from a different system of militaries that they had under the former regimes to a more modern, capable, deployable, interoperable militaries that, um, of course, um, is uh, worthy for them, but also for us when we work together in peacekeeping operations. And a, a quick word, Ambassador yes, Floor. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think, first of all, um, whenever I talk to uh, my fellow specialists on Afghanistan, they tell me that um, one of the key elements of stabilization for Afghanistan is um, the legitimacy of the elections 2014. Uh, so we, when we talk about stabil stability and security, inevitably, we also talk about the internal vulnerabilities of uh, uh, the, the countries in the region. That means that, um, of course, um, the threats uh, that, that exist, they are not um, uh, only external and they are not only, uh, uh, that, that are, they are not completely delinked from the question of uh, civil society, society participation in decision making, uh, good governance, um, uh, rule of law and so forth. And so therefore, uh, if, we, if we say that our, our common goal is really to move all of, the con all of these countries in the whole region together with our, with our support uh, in, 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 in the direction which would um, safeguard long-term stability, then we inevitably we have to talk about rule of law. Uh, it's not always easy, uh, I, I, I know, and um, certainly it's, uh, it's a long way to go.
But um, there, is, there are many programs where we do invest um, in supporting local government, in changing the legal system and the laws, in uh, working with civil society. Uh, and I, I, would, I would argue that um, we should um, do more, especially uh, also in, in that um, regard. So, so, Mr. Ambassador, the conversations about the rule of law, human rights, uh, democracy, probably don't come up as often in conversations, whether it's custom union, CSTO, Eurasian Union, CIS. Do these factors, are they going to have an impact over the long term about uh, Kazakhstan and your neighbors' willingness to play ball and engage with uh, NATO, OSCE, EU when there are a whole other set of actors that probably aren't raising some of the same issues? Oh, you know that Kazakhstan is uh, very active in uh, uh, the organizing uh, many international forums on, the, on different issues. And uh, this is the role, I think, of Kazakhstan to be uh, uh, on the distance between all the uh, participants of these processes. Uh, as for uh, concerning Afghanistan, you see, uh, um, uh, I hope that Kazakhstan uh, uh, can be uh, a bit more uh, objective uh, towards uh, the issues uh, of, uh, in this country, because we have no uh, ethnic group in uh, uh, Afghanistan like our uh, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, or uh, Turkmenistan partners. On the other hand, we are uh, uh, very in a close cooperation and integration with uh, Russia and Belarus in the uh, custom union. This is the uh, strategic line of our foreign policy. Uh, and uh, uh, you know that Kazakhstan is uh, uh, the first uh, Muslim country who, uh, uh, which was in a chairmanship on uh, OSCE. Uh, what does it mean? It means that Kazakhstan, on the one hand, uh, um, uh, participate, participates actively in the implementing of the standards of OSCE. On the other hand, uh, and, and this is our hope, that we uh, understand many, many uh, specific realities which, are, uh, which we have in our region and in Afghanistan uh, as well. And, uh, to speak frankly, I uh, say to my uh, Western partners many times uh, to be very, uh, I appeal them to be very delicate with these standards, especially in the uh, uh, issues uh, concerning the Afghanistan stabilization, because not all the standards are uh, uh, accepted very uh, 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 definitely in the uh, Muslim society, and we see it, and uh, we uh, uh, play the role of uh, bridge between uh, South Asia and uh, Europe, uh, Central Asia and Russia. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I want to bring in the audience now. If we get a mic to come to the center, we'll start here with Peter. Come next uh, to your colleague. Let me take a couple of, please, to the center. Mike, to the center of the room. And let me group a couple of questions, and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, Peter Semnaby, I'm a Swedish ambassador in Afghanistan. I want to thank you for very comprehensive uh, presentations a, a, uh, and a panel with, with a wide uh, variety of perspectives. That being said, uh, I uh, found uh, that uh, a few questions uh, were not as uh, prominently uh, displayed in, in this discussion as I would have uh, expected. Um, the first one is the uh, reconciliation process in Afghanistan. It seems clear that uh, many of the problems that we are talking about here are not going to be resolved until Afghanistan comes to peace um, uh, with itself. Uh, that also uh, relates uh, to the problem of the regional, the issue of the regional actors, to make sure that the regional actors contribute in a constructive way to uh, this uh, process. Uh, I sensed, uh, to the extent that this was, uh, was, was mentioned, uh, some uh, uh, discrepancy between the perspective uh, on the one hand that Patricia uh, gave. Uh, you stated that the regional actors have an interest in stability in Afghanistan. General Hogg seemed to uh, indicate uh, that there are regional actors who do not have uh, uh, such an interest. And I, I would like uh, you to explore, uh, to, to expand uh, on this issue of the uh, reconciliation uh, process. How do we bring in the regional actors and how does this relate to the timetable of the, of the drawdown? Is there a risk here uh, with a rather quick drawdown uh, that we may have uh, a vacuum that may be difficult to handle? The second uh, issue that I uh, missed, it was mentioned in passing, is the issue of uh, drugs. 
Um, as uh, the drawdown has now, now started, we also see from the statistics that uh, the uh, production of poppy in Afghanistan is actually increasing. Um, uh, it seems that it's playing a major role uh, in the conflict itself uh, uh, as a driver uh, of, that, uh, uh, of that conflict. And how, sh how we will we be able to reconcile this, uh, the, uh, the drawdown on the one hand and, and the increase of, of the poppy uh, uh, production. Isn't there a danger that those forces that uh, are threatening the stability of Afghanistan, uh, if we don't do anything about the drug problem, will uh, we will strengthen their hand? Uh, third issue and final one. Um, um, the, I, I miss uh, one perspective uh, in particular on the panel, and that is the perspective of the United Nations. Uh, presumably, as we move uh, from a military security logic to a more political and development logic of the international presence in Afghanistan, the role of the United Nations uh, uh, as in, in coordination, as a driver, uh, driver and coordinator of the international presence uh, will uh, will increase, and how do you uh, envisage uh, that role of the United Nations? Ambassador Rozai mentioned uh, an office in, uh, in, 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 in Kazakhstan, but I'm more talking about the role of, of the United Nations on the ground. This is a question I'm also asking against the background of the fact that the United Nations, for its presence in Afghanistan, is actually drawing down because of budget issues. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much. Come to your colleague just to your left. Klaus Wittmann, Aspen Institute, uh, Germany. I would like to make uh, a few remarks on the partnerships, but I cannot help making one comment before. If Ambassador Flor says Afghanistan is not just a task for one organization, that is so true. But I have to say, we are in where we are in Afghanistan now with many concerns and worries because the international community writ large has for too many years left too much of the task to one organization, and that is NATO. Now, um, on the partnerships, I would like to uh, say, because they were explained to, to a, a broad extent here, we all know in what respects NATO partnerships, particularly PFP, have been a success story. However, the rising number of partnerships from different regions with different interests and ambitions makes the management of partnerships increasingly cumbersome, complicates political oversight, fails to meet the expectations of some partners. And there was the 2011 reform package, uh, which uh, is regarded by some as a failure. It established a single menu of activities, but maintained the regional groupings, PFP, ICI, Mediterranean Dialogue, etc., which comprise very different countries. Political issues continue to interfere. Also, the issues of partners with deficits in the realization of NATO's values cannot be uh, overlooked. The research director of the NATO Defense College, where I worked in my last job, has made a uh, quite radical proposal that may be controversial, but which I would like to try out on the panel here. He said, abolish the regional frameworks and the EAPC and establish three, as it were, concentric cir circles. One, advanced partners, which I would even call associate members. Second, cooperation partners. And third, dialogue countries. And I would be very interested in a reaction. Terrific, thank you. These, uh, there's a lot of grist in these questions. Let me pick up a final comment here and then we'll come back to the panel. Jos Boomstra from Friede. Uh, I have a question about security sector reform. Uh, I heard uh, the speakers mention uh, on behalf of OECE, NATO, and uh, EU uh, different uh, security oriented projects. <clears throat> if we look, for instance, at the states of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, who both border uh, Afghanistan, if you look at the security sectors of these countries, they are in a deplorable state. They are absolutely non-democratic. Uh, the security services of these, or, uh, of these countries are in the business of regime security, not state security. The armed forces are not reformed and weak. 
the police is notoriously corrupt uh, and rent-seeking, and these states and their border securities are often implicated themselves in drug trade. Still, the OECE, NATO, and the EU, the US, and also other donors, sometimes Russia, invest money and try to help reform these countries and their security sectors. But what can be done if the regimes themselves have a direct interest in keeping a direct control over these security sectors that are absolutely anti-democratic? What can you do? What leverage do you have? And are there maybe options for NATO that is more in looking in defense, the EU looking at rule of law and police, and the OECE, border control and police, to have leverage together to try and help and reform, uh, help to reform in these two countries and also broader in Central Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's a lot there. I don't want each of you to address each of those points, but we've got reconciliation in Afghanistan, drugs going up as troops come down, the UN role being lacking, NATO too heavy in there, opportunity for new partnerships to engage some of these regions, and some very direct questions about the utility of some of the assistance in the security sector if you don't have the institutions that can actually do something with it. Um, maybe I'll come back to you, uh, Mr. Secretary General, to, to pick up a couple of those. Please, not all of them. Yeah, just, uh, just a couple. Um, uh, first of all, the, the, the issue of the drug uh, traffic, uh, we, we see it very clearly. We see the very negative impact that this has in a number of areas of the region in particular, uh, where it is creating also instability locally, and, uh, and uh, which requires uh, uh, for us the need, it poses the need to step up our engagement. And over time, this is going to, to get worse. Uh, so the, the problem must also be addressed at its origin. But of course, we are looking at the transit area and we're trying to improve the tools there. And this leads directly into the security sector reform issue, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is an area in which we are engaging, but it's a bit of a patchwork. We, we are doing police reform in Tajikistan. We're working on policing in Kyrgyzstan. We're working on trying to have a, a regional facility on policing, really, to, to try to bring them all together and, uh, and, and improve this. But we have started, and we, in fact, we're starting now with the upcoming chairmanship of the OSC, the Swiss. Uh, we, we are going to map out uh, uh, on, a, on a study uh, exactly on security sector reform, what we are doing, trying to make it more systematic, try to uh, see the areas where we haven't been effective enough. Of course, this will not answer your question. And your question is how can we uh, push it whenever we find resistance is a question that requires also inclusion of uh, leverage, in some case political leverage that the OSC alone cannot have. That's where we need to work on synergies, to develop synergies with other actors, partner organizations first of all and, and, uh, uh, and countries. Um, if I may make one, one larger point please, please. Uh, very quickly, we have to pay attention also uh, to uh, avoiding as much as possible. This is why I believe that it's important uh, multilateralism and multilateral engagement with all the frustrations that this brings because there are different agendas. But I think it's important to maintain this broad engagement. This goes in the direction of the UN question as well, even though the UN is a good partner for us. And, and, uh, Kubish is one of my predecessors, in fact, so we were working very well together, but the agenda doesn't necessarily fit very well uh, when it comes to Afghanistan itself. Uh, we, we must do everything to avoid that uh, the Afghanistan issue and, and, the, and the larger area becomes too much uh, an area of competition for influence among uh, international key, key stakeholders and key players. Uh, so through engagement international organizations, we can try uh, to uh, get them all to engage more cooperatively, perhaps uh, with a, lo a lower common denominator, but, but to develop strategies that involve the, all of them. I think that's essential for the success together with the countries of the region, of course. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Kalinda, Madam Minister, let's come back to you on this and maybe pick up also on the partnership issue. Yes, um, absolutely, just you know, to pick up all on, on the, to start with the leverage. Um, as you know, the best leverage that NATO or the EU can have is the attraction of membership, which in this case does not exist. So um, the, it's more, uh, an issue of the, goodwill the of cooperation. Her head. Yes, <laughs> yes, and, and, and. So it's it's an issue of mutual cooperation, mm -hmm. and really uh, the realization of these countries 
uh, even though they all have their multi-vector policy, they're oriented towards different areas, different organizations, they nevertheless realize the value of the security of the whole region. Uh, that includes also political uh, reform and re the reform of the military and the security sector to be under civilian control. And I think that as all of these processes of democratization democratization move in, so will the democratization of the military and the security uh, sector. So it's, it's a cooperative effort right now. Now on the partnerships, I, I think the partnerships are extremely valuable. I respect NDC very much. I'm actually on the board of academic advisors of the NATO Defense College. They're a little bit um, we we'll let them uh, in independence in their thinking so uh, we, we get valuable ideas and of course NATO has to keep changing if the security environment changes it and keep responding to new threats but also new ways of cooperation how to counter those threats mm -hmm. and as I already noted today threats have become global so they require a global response. I think that the partnerships should be first and foremost tailor-made as to the needs of NATO and the needs of the respective countries and the joint interests and the joint security threats that we share. So right now we have um, individual partnerships, we have regional partnerships such as um, the Mediterranean Dialogue and the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. Not all of them want to engage in a, specific, in a more specific dialogue with us. So it's also our response to what the countries want. But certainly I, for one, would like to see more of uh, institutionalization of partnerships. We currently have 41 formal partners with whom we have partnership frameworks, but I, I think we should be moving also towards countries such as China and India and Brazil, maybe not in terms of formalized uh, partnerships, but certainly in terms of dialogue of uh, the pertinent issues. And we haven't mentioned China today in the context of Central Asia, but definitely um, as uh, a world power and a regional power there and the uh, economic influence that they're exerting right now, they're very important. Just briefly on reconciliation, because Peter and I used to work together actually very concretely on that issue uh, in Croatia. The reason why we I haven't mentioned it on behalf of NATO because for us reconciliation is a national process. It should be Afghan-led, perhaps of course with the, the assistance, the help, facilitation of the international community, um, certain uh, individual countries, but it's first and foremost for Afghans to lead and to work on the reintegration of the, the former insurgents. For us, based on certain principles, giving up on violence, accepting the constitution, um, implementing the constitutions and human rights, and of course accepting Afghanistan and the legally elected Afghan government. Last, drugs. Um, very important, 90% of opium production comes out of Afghanistan. It's a big social problem for many countries, but also a security problem as it feeds terrorism in terms of monetary um, ways. Uh, we do have programs where we build internal capacities of these countries, not just Afghanistan, but the neighboring countries to train their officers to do uh, counter trafficking. And as you know, there are also some programs in Afghanistan on alternative crops for farmers, etc. But um, it's always balancing of economic um, issues, ec economic means, but certainly an issue where we need to remain seized and where we need to ha see more international cooperation. Thank you, thank you. I'm trying to keep us on track, so I'm gonna keep your answers tight to, as we wrap up here. Um, but uh, Ambassador Floor, if you could pick up, Josh had some pretty challenging questions. If you could pick up an element of that as <laughs> well in your response. <laughs> yes, uh, but let me, let me start with him addressing uh, Peter's question regional actors' contribution and interest in stability. Now, of course, you have to, to ask the actors themselves. Uh, do they have a real interest or no? And I can imagine where your question is coming from. But let me say, uh, we should not be captured by uh, the negative scenarios uh, only about um, Afghanistan. And if I look at the, um, the opportunities in terms of now making progress uh, for regional cooperation, for trade, for uh, linking, for instance, um, the energy resources of Central Asia with Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, or uh, giving access to deeply landlocked Central Asia through transit networks, which would give them access to, um, if, to international ports and, and, and seas um, south of them. I think there are huge opportunities, and therefore I, I would say that um, uh, whatever people say, but they have a real stake in uh, instability and in making these projects work. And 
electricity, electricity export from Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, through Afghanistan to Pakistan and India cannot work unless there is a certain stability. And Turkmenistan will not get its gas pipeline uh, through Afghanistan to Pakistan again if that is not uh, there. One word on drugs. Uh, the, the UN ODC, so it's UN and drugs. The UN ODC uh, actually has a big regional program. We are working with UN ODC within the heroin route program of um, the European Union because we know that the drug issue is a key issue that needs to be uh, addressed. And the UN contribution, of course, will be as crucial as the EU, OECE, NATO contribution because as we see the drawdown of forces, uh, the, where should um, the support to social, social and economic development come from? It must come through civilian uh, projects of cooperation, and the UN uh, and the other organizations are well placed to actually do this. Uh, just one word, uh, NATO might have had the dominant role, yes, but there is UPOL and there, there was engagement, maybe not that visible by the EU and others, uh, because the NATO was so dominant, but it, it, it certainly has been there in Afghanistan for a very long time. And now I come to the... Um, you saved yourself uh, the, the tough questions yes. a very now, few times, the very, very little the time. toughest. And now I, of course, um, I don't think that anyone has um, I illusions about uh, uh, the, 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 pro the, the problems within Central Asia, within uh, the different um, uh, security forces, but also within administration and so forth. And part of it might be, and it's certainly related also to uh, corruption and to other problems, but part of it is also, create, is, is also related to capacity. Uh, the capacity, for instance, to really then uh, address um, some of the uh, threats that might come uh, over the border in terms of detection, in terms of actually dealing with it, in, in terms of training. And I do think that um, while we will do our best to ensure that um, the EU programs address these issues in the proper way and achieve um, the, the common goal, namely to increase security for everyone, I think that is, that's the key, and that, that's what, we're gonna do, what's, what we will continue to do. Let me just say that there will be, uh, in uh, early October in Turkmenistan, uh, a conference by the EU Central Asia Border Security Initiative with OECE, with US, uh, with um, Afghanistan and others to look at uh, who does what in the security sector in border security and uh, how does that fit together on, and what are the key challenges. At the end of the day, however, I come back to what I said earlier on, uh, ownership and political will needs to be there uh, with the governments in the region because, of course, uh, none of this can be assured uh, by outside actors uh, uh, from, or only by, by their own uh, goodwill. Thank we, you, Madam Ambassador. So, Mr. Ambassador, back to you then. Are you worried about the rise of drugs with what's going to happen? And can you be credible partners on security sector reform or these other issues? Uh, we um, try to cooperate with our partners in uh, our region uh, in, in the framework of the uh, CARIC, it's a Central Asian uh, in Coordination Information Center uh, on drugs, uh, precursors, uh, narcotics. And uh, when I, I, I heard to the, uh, when I listened to the uh, question of our guest, so I have, uh, I had one very important uh, idea. Uh, uh, while uh, um, turning uh, the uh, military uh, campaign uh, to the uh, resolute support and uh, other kind of support to Afghanistan, we should not forget about uh, the uh, seeking uh, of uh, pure and effective instrument uh, against drug trafficking. Because now we have the problem uh, that uh, uh, the NATO uh, forces uh, are not uh, uh, in capacity of uh, anti-drug uh, uh, activity and uh, we have not still the uh, combined efforts uh, and uh, combined instruments on the territory of Afghanistan uh, uh, in fighting uh, the uh, drug producing and drug trafficking. We have only the organizations which work around Afghanistan and uh, uh, respecting my uh, Afghan partners uh, we uh, should realize that uh, their uh, abilities are not still enough uh, for effective uh, uh, anti-drug uh, uh, fighting. Okay. On that note of concern, let me turn to our sp plain-spoken general for the final word about <laughs> some of those elements, but perhaps the narcotics issue as well. 
Yeah, uh, when you start talking about the narcotics issues and uh, as far as the U.S. position in Afghanistan, I mean, we're looking at where those nexus targets, those are the ones where you have the transitioning between the drug guy and the terrorist person. I mean, that's our concern. Now, on the political military, or excuse me, political economic and some of these other pieces that, that's being worked through the, the, through the embassy and how they interact with the other players within Afghanistan. But I think when we get right down to it, it's, it's ultimately, it's got to be the Afghanistan government's problem. I mean, they've got to solve this stuff. The Afghans have got to solve this thing. We can provide the input. We can provide the support. But it's going to have to take their political will to do the right thing. And I'm not sure if we're there yet. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to sum up. We're headed for a tough challenge. I think we've heard from your messages that we've spent a, the past decade almost with the transatlantic community tethered to the region. Um, yet even tethered to the region, it's been difficult to forge the right kind of stable, constructive relationships with countries in the region. It's going to be more difficult to sustain the attention in Washington and Brussels and other capitals. But also I think we're hearing a lot about the political will of the region uh, to keep the reforms going that are required to keep this transatlantic community engaged. And I think the premise of all of this is that, and part of why we're doing this in Latvia, which is now focused on the region, um, the more the Europe, the United States, the international organizations represented here are engaged, the stronger the independence and sovereignty of, I think, these countries are going to be, the more chance for security, prosperity, and reform, I think, exists. So I want to thank this panel for a terrific conversation representing a broad range of views. Uh, please join me in, in congratulating and thanking our, our guests here.